My name is Matt Cameron. I've been the head fencing coach at Culver Academy since uh, 2014. Uh, I grew up north of Chicago in Lake County in a town called Lincolnshire. And a um, uh, great small town um, and was uh, sort of a multi-sport athlete doing different things. Uh, sort of my first love in life was baseball and I uh, was really big in basketball. And of course, growing up in Chicago in the 90s, basketball was huge and uh, it was a really great time uh, to be a sports fan. Um, so I started fencing really when I was about uh, 11, 12, and uh, it was something that I had always liked, saw in the movies, saw on TV. I uh, didn't really know what the athletic demands for, uh, for it were, but uh, it was uh, lots of fun. So the high school that I eventually ended up going to was Stevenson High School, and they had a fencing team. So my folks called one of my older sister's friends who was on the team and um, sort of got in touch with the coach, and the coach got me started at a private club um, at Illinois Fencers Club in Des Plaines, or Mount Prospect. And um, so I started doing private lessons there for a couple of years and uh, really started falling in love with it. Then I uh, became a freshman at uh, Stevenson, joined the team, and then really got the, got the, uh, the itch to do more and uh, did some fencing camps in, uh, over the summer. Really got, uh, really got into it and that's pretty much specialized my, my sophomore year. Uh, there I switched, uh, switched clubs from IFC to a club in the city of Chicago, uh, Fencing 2000, which is down in the loop. It was at Jefferson and Jackson. And it was an old warehouse space and all we did was fence. And um, we had um, a, a number of coaches who came through, um, but my coach uh, was the cadet, the under 17 and under 20 women's foil national coach for uh, Mexico. Uh, he was a uh, Soviet World Cup champion from the from Kazakhstan um, came through uh, international coaching and landed in Chicago uh, he and I clicked right away and um, so that was a really great time in, in my development uh, and my my sort of ambition to do more in the sport really clicked with his ambition coming to the states and so we worked really well together and um, by the time I was a uh, junior in high school I was on the junior national team and I, I competed at the junior Pan Am Games in uh, Puerto Rico, and that was really great. Um, so we started only doing national tournaments and uh, doing well there, uh, moving through the development plan for USA Fencing, and uh, it was great. Uh, at the time, I was doing under 17s, under 20s, and Division Ones. Uh, There's a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, <clears throat> it's just, it's just getting better in, in doing camps and doing that, so I ended up getting pretty good quickly, um, and I kind of was hoping that I maybe started fencing earlier, uh, but at the end of the day, specializing at 14 was, was not bad due to my athletic background and, and sort of my drive to get better. And um, so I stayed in Chicago, went to Loyola University of Chicago, um, and I was really concentrated on, uh, you know, fencing, academics, uh, being on a national team. Um, and so I competed through Division Ones until I was maybe about 22, 23. And at that time, um, I started working for the Bulls, Blackhawks, and White Sox in their video coaching departments, which was lots of fun. But it also exposed me to, you know, high-level elite coaching and, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with uh, elite athletes was great um, just in the hole with all the coaches getting ready in preparation and all the time and energy that that takes was uh, was a really fun time so I worked for the uh, for the sports teams in Chicago for three years and um, you know uh, in that same time I met my wife and you know we started a family bought a house in suburbia and I kind of took a took a break from fencing uh, then a couple years later, um, after the kids were out of diapers and uh, more stable nighttime sleepers and on a really good schedule, uh, started getting the itch to fence again. Uh, started coming back as an athlete uh, 20, 2007 and 2008. Um, and there, you know, there had been some changes in the game. And so I was one of these sort of vets coming back and wasn't too old, but I was maybe a little out of shape. Uh, but it was still tons of fun. Fencing's the best workout nobody's doing. And uh, so I got back in shape and I started helping out with the junior cadet teams at uh, my old coach's new club that was in, uh, that's still in Park Ridge, Illinois, the Fencing Center of Chicago. 
and then um, also a national level in NCAA referee. And so networking through there, I knew an opportunity here in Marshall County at Culver Academies became available. And, um, and the rest is history. Yeah, uh, so I started with foil. So it's modern Olympic fencing. So it's not stage combat. It's not historical fencing. It's, it's, it's what you see in the Olympics. And uh, so I started with foil. Historically, that's pretty much what you start with. It's the lightest of the weapons, and it uh, introduces both the thrusting aspects of foil and epee and the right-of-way aspects of foil and saber. So typically, people do a year or however long their program um, gets them going to then choose a weapon. And I stuck with foil, uh, and foil is uh, it's my primary weapon now. Yeah, yeah. So um, earning a, earning a spot on the U.S. national team was uh, was major. Um, it was a, it was sort of in the moment of doing something bigger than yourself. You're representing your comp uh, your your country in international competition. And then I had done tons of North American Cups in uh, in the United States. And so this was more than just another tournament. This was you know got the team sweats. You know you're there for a really long time. Um, I think we stayed there maybe 10 days, seven to 10 days. Um, and uh, so that, that was great. Um, I had friends on, you know, from clubs all over the country who are on this team. And uh, for some of us, it was our first team. For others, they had other, you know, international experience. So it was good. To, it was a good collection. It was a great experience for everybody. With the White Sox, I started like in the spring. So with the White Sox, what was great with that is the video room is in the dugout. And so if you, you know, you see the dugout and the guys go down, there's a, there are a couple of batting cages and then the video room's right here. And at the United Center, it's down the hall and it's a huge sort of, you know, video room with the big wall, of TVs and stuff. Um, White Sox was cool because um, everything was compiled and edited in real, real time. We were using custom software that was, I think it used the plumbing and the backbone of Final Cut. And um, what was great about it was in the 90s, now the Reinsdorf group owned the Bulls and the White Sox, they still do. Um, in the 90s when they were building out the United Center, uh, they had made a decision to go big with video coaching. And in those first couple of championship seasons, Phil Jackson, you know, could point out which which games video coaching made the difference in the win. So spent a lot of money there uh, in doing that. And because it's the same ownership group, they dumped a lot of resources into the new um, Comiskey Park. Uh, so that was a good time to be there because I was right on the edge of new technology in professional sports as it's, you know, being used in NBA and MLB. Uh, and the same thing with the NHL. Uh, so uh, what was cool was, was that is I got a chance to meet uh, my childhood hero in Harold Baines, who was a, a hitting coach. Uh, he was a first baseman coach kind of thing and um, big fan of Frank Thomas and had conversations with Frank Thomas. And uh, it was really great just to see the way that high level pro uh, professional athletes go about their business on game day because we generally see them if you're if you have a chance to go to you know Arizona or Florida catch a spring training game it's you know it's a lot less stress and they're more accessible here it's they're at work and these are these are you know high high talent uh, professional athletes working it's, it's kind of cool to rub shoulders there but uh, really really nice about that system on the tech side was that you know, as soon as somebody struck out or, you know, Nardi Contreras is going to sit down with, let's say, a Mark Burley and want to go over that previous inning of pitches, pitch selection, execution, you could do that in real time. So it was nice that we were able to be able to compile that and have that ready inside of a couple of minutes. And it was all, all teed up and, and really smooth. We do our best with um, video coaching now with fencing. Um, and that is absolutely something that's a resource that's used um, at the national level and NCAA and, and international. Um, as much as we can do it with the resources that we have, um, we do it. And so we can take a look at uh, specific things. We can look at uh, you know, tendencies and really get into the nitty gritty of small you know, technique things that make a difference uh, in real time and in fencing time. Yeah, it was great. Uh, the hair was on fire and uh, it was just all go. 
So being familiar with high school fencing, uh, Culver Academy has a rich history of fencing um, and you know, decades long. We were, were sort of a charter member of our conference, the Great Lakes High School Fencing Conference. And when I was competing in high school, there were only uh, six teams. It was uh, Culver, Nutrier, Stevenson High School, um, Maine West, Catholic Memorial, and that was it. Now we have 14 uh, schools and it's a pretty well rounded out conference. And we have uh, you know, a northern section, a, mid, a middle, you know, a central section and a southern section. And, and most of our conferences in Chicagoland, we have two teams in Wisconsin and uh, just us here in Indiana. Um, so as, a, you know, as I started, um, you know, I came in feeling huge shoes. Um, the, the previous coach, Dr. Igor Stefanik was um, you know, a science teacher here who had uh, a, a profound impact on the development of the program in the previous 10 years. Um, he was instrumental in raising money and building out our, um, our space and um, stepped up recruiting to attract the athlete who is a uh, scholar athlete looking to fence in college, looking to take the next leap in uh, personal leadership. and. That was great. So he had success, um, major success on our high school conference, generally winning most of the uh, titles. And um, his kids who he recruited uh, from the national level did, did great. So um, that was really great that the sort of table was set in a way that uh, Culver was uh, open and receptive to larger things. And um, if things were developed in the proper way, then you know, it's easy for le letting the kids uh, develop in that in, in that way. So for me coming in, it was getting to know Culver. Um, it's a different working environment. It's in a different coaching environment, being an independent boarding school in uh, in North Central Indiana. Um, so I moving moving from Chicagoland, coming here was sort of uh, difference. Interesting transition, um, but it, the opportunity was great. Uh, I had a, I was, I was lucky enough to start with Culver Summer Schools and Camps um, the summer before I, I joined the winter school, and that was by design. I really wanted to get in and understand Culver and hit the ground running uh, when uh, the winter school started. Uh, that allowed me to get to know the space, get to know sort of the rhythm of campus, and I soon learned that the rhythm of summer is totally different than winter, but uh, understanding sort of the mission goals and the larger kinds of things that Culver is attempting to do and succeeding in uh, helped me as I, as I was joining a team with really dedicated juniors and senior athletes who uh, had great ownership of the program. And I, I really wanted to win them over and, and provide them with the most authentic fencing experience. And um, they were incredibly receptive and it was tons of, tons of fun. I think so, <laughs> you know? Right, so I think, I think that, um, I don't know sort of what everyone's expectations were for me. I wanted to, you know, considering the access and the support, the, um, the, the attention uh, that the kids give to the game, the, the difference are, are the kids. And the kids um, are, are very focused, very ambitious, and they just need to be led to where they can have more uh, you know, success. So for me, coming from uh, domestic uh, you know, high-level stuff, going to different types of tournaments seemed like the natural thing for our kids who were uh, taking advantage of their opportunities here, but were ready for the next challenge. And so for me, it was just starting with challenge and, and asking more of them to give to find out more about what they're capable of doing. And so we, you know, we had a, a really focused group, a very tight uh, group, and um, did the high school season and did very well there. And uh, we went to our first North American Cup. It was a Division Three uh, North American Cup in Reno, Nevada. And typically we would just go to Junior Olympics. And so we would hit a national tournament on the schedule one, one time. And Junior Olympics is a, a very difficult tournament. Uh, but I felt like if we had, you know, kids who were ready for the next step, but then would sort of go too far and, and go to a, a more difficult tournament that might give them, well, it would be a, a tremendous experience for them. Um, it's a very hard tournament and building on success after 
just being wiped out wasn't uh, wasn't the way that I wanted it necessarily to go. So I felt like within the structure of tournaments at the national level, uh, there were sort of right-sized tournaments for our kids and their developments, and uh, that proved to be successful. So we had uh, a senior in Megan Yeager who was our captain and did very well in our conference. Uh, she earned a national medal, and that was sort of proof of concept, knowing that, hey, you know, this is something that we can do, we can take seriously, and, and work and develop on it. So every, every season thereon, we, we've had national medals, and we've had more, more kids interested in fencing in college, and, and now fencing in college, and fencing not only in club, but Division three and Division one schools. So there are a couple of things that are really important. Uh, overall, athleticism is, is is really important. Um, it's an individual sport, so uh, sometimes it attracts a different type of kid. Uh, it's a cerebral sport. They call it physical chess for a reason. You have to use strategy at the uh, forefront of your game plan. Um, it's uh, understanding your your, uh, your opponent's uh, strengths and anticipating what they're good at, what they're not so good at, game planning around scoring touches that way. Um, so you're, you're looking for a cerebral kid, you're looking, through, uh, looking for um, sort of a, a strong athletic IQ. Um, and for me, being a multi-sport athlete, being around teams and, and that kind of stuff uh, re really lends itself to organization and making it feel like a team. Sometimes we have kids in a fencing club and, or in individual sports that come in and they kind of do their business and then they go. Here at Culver, it's such a it's such a strong team, cohesive uh, cultural uh, cultural environments. Uh, we've got kids from all over the world finding fencing, and um, so for us, it's just about it's about finding a kid who is who can who can manage uh, manage the the workload at Culver, manage the sort of newness of a, a different game that they may not have had exposure to, but then are. We find most of the time kids fall right in love with fencing and they, uh, they really love the cerebral part, the problem solving. And uh, so there's really not uh, anybody in particular that we would take over anybody else. I think that uh, it's an Olympic sport. Uh, it's in the, in the Olympic movement and spirits of inclusion and equality. So we want to make as many opportunities available for kids. And, um, and I think in our program now, we've developed to a point where there's upward mobility and most kids who have a chance to join our team um, will have success in lots of different ways. Yeah, um, personally or for, for coaching or in general or just? Um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to, because I know that some of the viewers of the video probably wouldn't mm -hmm. know much about fencing. Sure. So I thought maybe it'd be good to kind of show them what a fencer is thinking about when they're fencing. Like they're not just yeah. out there slashing around, they're right. looking for ways to... I think it's important to really uh, prepare the student's mind in that this is high problem solving in real time. And when you're wrong, you get hit with a weapon, okay? So there is a, a level of emotional management that comes in with that. And uh, one of the things that exposed uh, with our kids here is, um, you know, kids here are, are used to success. They're used to doing well, or they're used to knowing the game plan to have success right away and they, they just put in the work and grind and, and are successful. Um, and fencing's a little bit different. There, it's not a, an object that goes through a plane or into a net. Uh, there's not a, a PR time um, components where if you do better then you get a better time, you win sort of thing. You're actually competing against somebody and there's not a weight class and there's not a um, sort of uh, height thing. Um, it's all about who's executing their ideas better and who's managing all the situations best. So with our kids, uh, before we go in, we really are, are going in to look for data, right? So we really want to expose what our opponent's not doing well or find out what they're doing well. If we just go in and we, we just do what we think is going to be effective, um, we, we're not aware of what they're doing too. And they're also trying to, in, in many cases, uh, expose what we're good at and what we're not good at. And then, um, you know, we can devise a plan after that. But um, it, it's really about stringing actions together that make sense in sort of the longer conversation of the bout. And uh, so some you can kind of, you know, as the flow of the, the bout goes, a, a particular action here would be most appropriate and high percentage. Um, and then after that, they now have been exposed to a different set of 
uh, options for the other person. If we can stay a step ahead or maybe two steps ahead, we can sort of forecast what, that, what that's going to uh, allow. But fencing is also like uh, complete improv too. So you have to be dynamic and uh, be able to change on a dime and um, always try to stay a step ahead in the thought process and how you're managing actions to really expose the highest percentage uh, opportunities. Yeah, so um, I think there are a couple of things. You, you want to you you be confident in what you're doing. I think that uh, as a combat sport, everything you're doing is data for your opponent. The opponent is looking for weaknesses, um, and weaknesses in body language, demeanor, uh, what you're getting upset about. They want to push buttons and uh, get you more upset because then that'll, you, you won't be as focused and you can't handle that high volume problem solving. Um, and so for us, um, we want confidence. We want, we want somebody to have their voice, um, not also, not so in their, not as much so in their decision making, but um, being confident because it's just, we have two athletes competing, but there's a referee and the referee is you know, interpreting and calling and it's subjective. So it's almost a performance. You really need to show the referee that this is yours and, and uh, executing your uh, actions that at a high percentage rate that uh, you will get credit for. And if you're kind of showing weakness or it's, it doesn't look confident, um, that hurts your chances of winning over uh, and getting credit for technically sound actions. Uh, you can really complete the picture if you're, if you're standing with confidence and you're doing uh, things technically sound. Um, so we're looking for kids to um, be confident, stand up straight, um, and that's something that comes with experience. When we go to the national tournaments, it's a gigantic room, and we have uh, it's, it's a big deal. We've got TV cameras there. We've got uh, all the stuff. You're, you're competing about uh, against the best kids in the country, and um, part of that is getting used to the room, knowing how to conduct yourself and, and know the rhythm of what that tournament's like, because it's totally different than our high schools. Um, and uh, so once our kids are, are, are doing this at the national level, they get into the, the high school thing and they get, they're, they're, really, they're really confident and they do very well. Um, so personal confidence, um, decisive actions, we're looking for um, clear, clear thought, right? Consistent thoughts. Uh, some things, sometimes things go sideways um, or you know, the opponent makes an adjustment and it's about how quickly you can adjust to that. And that's most, most of the time what's happening. If we get stuck in a rut and we can't make that change, then uh, we're not gonna have success. So letting go of things that we want to do or that we're comfortable doing um, when they're not being uh, successful is really, really important. And in this age group, that's a challenge because we have, um, you know, young developing minds and sometimes teenagers can be stubborn and they don't wanna change, but they, they get exactly what they get when they don't, you know? So that, that lesson is really important. And uh, they learn a lot about themselves and patience and sort of understanding that if I really want to do this, it's not the right time and place, I might have to do something different to set that up. And that kind of thing is, is really the essence of the game. I think uh, we, we had a really good team, a men's foil team in the late 90s at Fencing 2000. It was my coach, Bakit Abdukulov. Um, teammates and Steve Gerberman and Philippe Pierre and Scott Sherman. And um, so we're all teenagers grinding all the time in this, you know, repurposed warehouse space on the ninth floor of the James T. Igo building at Je uh, Jefferson and Jackson. And, um, you know, uh, we just, it would be one of those things that total teammates, uh, we compete, every, every practice was a war. You know, we'd get into fights, but then we'd like hug it out and make, make up. Uh, it was just a, a great environment to, to be successful. So here we are at, at um, 1998 Division One Nationals. We're fencing team and we're in New York City. We're in, um, you know, we're in Harlem at the, at the armory there. And um, we're fencing to get into the top four. So we've done well. We beat uh, LAIFC or West Coast Fencing and West Side Fencing from LA. In, to get into the four, and now we have to fence to get into the uh, the the medal rounds, and um, we're having um, we're having a fence against the New York Athletic Club, right? So AC, uh, countless Olympians, uh, all the history, 
And it's Cliff Bear, it's Ben Atkins, and it's David Ledeau. And David Ledeau is a kid who I knew. He sort of fenced at Fence in 2000. He was a fencer at New Trier. Uh, he's a Div 1 blue chip recruit at Penn State. He made um, world teams and stuff. And so he's, he's a buddy. He, he's sort of a adversary. He's a couple years older. And um, so Cliff Bear um, was, uh, was a fantastic fencer. He's an amazing fencer. He made the top eight of the 1996. Uh, Olympics in Atlanta. Um, at that point, he was our most successful men's foil fencer and uh, sort of um, set the table for international success that came later after him. So he was one of our, uh, you know, one of our sort of leaders in our generation. So fencing him, uh, I, I did well. I scored more points than he did when we, when we fenced. And in this team relay, it's a team tournament or a team match to 45. And we were down, they were really good. Um, but uh, so I had uh, beat Dave Lido and I beat uh, uh, Cliff Bear only by scoring more uh, touches. And of course they, they won that lap, but uh, that was good. Um, we matched up well. So I didn't always do really well against high level fencers, but sometimes those matchups were there. And um, it was just a great experience. Our, our teammates uh, did very well. Philippe uh, Pierre went on to DePaul and uh, did a, a five-year five program in accounting. and. Uh, Got a CPA out of that and worked at uh, Deloitte Touche. Uh, Scott Sherman was a, uh, a big uh, fencer, fence at Princeton, uh, competed at NCAAs. Um, and uh, my coach was there kind of being the old old guard, helping us out. And of course he was uh, you know, very, very successful in the 80s and, and things like that, but had these vet moves that were, were really great. So uh, it was a really uh, a good time. Uh, another, another time I was fencing in the top 16 at Division I Nationals. In the top 16, this is a, you know, and you're in the top 16, that you're, you're one touch away from making making the finals, and it's a really big deal. Um, and so I had an old teammate who was uh, competing with us, uh, Steve Gerberman, whose family moved to um, Houston, and uh, he was working with a, a top level coach uh, from the Egyptian system in Moro Hamza. And uh, so we were totally good friends and all that, but we, we finally get to 14 14. And when we are we are uh, old competitors and teammates, and teammate bouts are the worst because it's either you know you lose 15-2, 15-10 or whatever, or it's always like one touch away, one action away of somebody else beating each other. So we went back and forth for, for years. Um, and uh, that was just a lot of fun, a lot of kids watching. And uh, he needed to, to make this final to secure a spot to a junior world team. So he was coming really, uh, really, uh, really strong. And uh, I wanted to make my first division one uh, national championship and we go and uh, he ends up winning and it was tons of fun big hug at the end there's no animosity and there's usually not in fencing um, but uh, it was great it was a memorable about that um, you know he went went on to fence at Stanford and have uh, great success so it was good just to be a part of that um, a part of his story and he and I had uh, a great bout. You know there have been so many there's uh, our kids are, are, are doing so well um, Matches. I think that the in the top 16 of that North American Cup Division Three tournament in uh, Reno, Nevada, and, and then it was the 2014-15 season. So it was uh, in the spring of 15. Megan Yeager has to fence against um, a college fencer at uh, from Columbia. And Columbia is a perennial. They're in the top two, top three of NCAA championships all the time. I mean, at the time they had won, or they were about to win back-to-back -back championships as the best or one of the best um, uh, programs in the country. And so here she is, high school fencer, um, fencing against an NCAA Division I uh, athlete. And she, she won. She won. And it was like, it was the best thing ever. And so what was the best part about it, what really got me turned on, more turned on about Culver, were her teammates. Her teammates were over the moon they just they were so happy for Megan she was sort of our our rock on the team she had done well she was a captain uh, you know she always made uh, great results in our conference but she was a leader on the team and here she was having individual success and they were just gushing over her and uh, it was so much fun and I just remember getting we're in the finals top eight lots of people watching and here she is and she has to fence she ended up fencing against the, the girl who won and she, I'm hooking her up and giving her the pregame talk. And she's like, honestly, 
I'm super happy about this. If this doesn't go well, I'm unsatisfied and that's good. And so on one hand, as a coach, I'm like, how could you say that? We have another bout. We got to go. We're going to fight. And otherwise, you know, for her, she had, she, she was fulfilled, you know, and, and that whole thing was also just, uh, uh, just a great moment to be around. And so she ends up losing the spot, but the experience was amazing for her. And she comes back to uh, Culver with the National Medal to show her teammates and her friends. And um, it was really special. Yeah, for, for me on the coaching side, I just, I know that each one of these results or these moments are just a, a stop in their development. So it's not sort of, I know that they're, they will have more success in the future. So it's, it's nice to them, uh, nice for them to have that individual success, but um, they also know that they're still developing and they're still growing. And so they're still hungry. So I think sometimes there's a, we have the moment to be satisfied and um, we can be happy with that. But they also know that uh, they're going to have success in their life and they should, they should plan for this and they should understand the feeling of that and let that be an, as an inspiration to work more and, and continue grinding. And uh, we, we see that at all of the levels in our, in our program. I think I think it's um, due to due to the, the sort of uniqueness of the game, and there we in the first couple of years we hadn't had as many kids who were choosing to come to Culver uh, with fencing experience as maybe we have now. Um, so those kids understanding the sort of the larger scope of what the game teaches you, and patience, and sort of forethought, and the strategy of problem solving. Um, everyone's learning style and work style is different. And as much as we can develop a strong team culture where everyone understands that, yes, this is an incredibly difficult sport and that it's uh, demanding emotionally and physically, that um, everyone's got each other's back. So my, my sort of mission coming in was I really wanted to double down on the, on the culture side of things because it's really unique. And the more we have um, a strong team environment, the, more comfortable people are going to be, the more at ease they are, the better they can manage situations. So that was that was it. But we have we have kids who who deal with challenge in different ways. And so the coach for me, it's just understanding the kid and, and what their triggers are and what uh, what they're motivated by. And for some kids, it's way different. Lots of listening and a lot of paying attention uh, to what they're responding to and what makes them tick. Uh, and at Culver, it's, it's challenging because it's a, it's, it's a new living environment. It's a new academic environment. If they're coming from an old team, they're on a new team. And uh, there's a lot happening in that first and second year for our kids. Um, as they get older, then the Culver effect takes over. They sort of get it. And um, the juniors and seniors and our, and our older leaders on the team um, really help out. They help out in a way that uh, you, would, you would see in a, in a club at maybe a, a a three weapon sort of a, you know national level club at home kind of thing but we we double down on the team culture we 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 make very um make it very clear what what's important to the to the team and what's important to the the uh, to how we're going to manage our success and how we're going to go about our business so we really want the kids to be free and so you know it's loose um but you know we have you know, really clear boundaries on what's acceptable and what's not. And then kind of outside of that, they have the freedom to be themselves. And the more they're comfortable uh, being themselves, again, they're, they're going to be more at ease and better, better prepared to manage uh, problem solving. And that's, that's all the game is, is problem solving. Uh, it's unique to Culver. And I think that in a boarding school environment, they, they, they have a sense of what they're getting themselves into. And as uh, coaches and faculty, staff type people here, um, we're just focused on their developments. And it's character developments. And we use different things for leadership developments. And the more confidence the kid has, uh, the, better the better leader they're going to be. Um, the more receptive to change they're going to be and better prepared to manage and pivot. And I think that the giving them uh, an opportunity to make mistakes here um, on the sort of field of play in athletics is really great because it exposes data that they can build on. And fencing is one of those things, like I said before, if you make a mistake, you're getting hit, right, with a weapon. And um, 
It's uh, one of those things. There's immediate, uh, there's, there's immediate feedback, and there's immediate fe feedback on doing something correctly. So, um, but that's that's life. I mean, so if you do something wrong, you, you're going to get checked, and then if it's about how you pick yourself up, and that's literally how things are happening in the game of fencing. I really loved baseball. Baseball is great. I love baseball movies. You know, I feel, I feel like I wore out our VHS tape of The Natural and Major League, right? Um, and um, I just loved going to uh, Old Comiskey Park and watching, watching the White Sox and um, having, you know, animated conversations uh, with Cubs fans. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a strategy game. Uh, pitching, the, the, the pitching aspect of baseball is a lot like fencing, where setting pitches up, there are different scenarios and there are different variables, and you have that in fencing. So I think that worked out really good. Um, when my kids were young, I was coaching, you know, Y10, Y8, softball, baseball, t-ball, and all that stuff. And for me, that was, that was a natural. We just want to make it fun. We want them to fall in love with it. They want to you know, get the kids active and have, uh, have all the benefits of team and, and all that in a really sort of uh, safe environment. Uh, for fencing, uh, same thing. Working with really young kids is different than middle school age kids to high school kids. And at the core of it, it just has to be fun. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be really um, hard and it shouldn't be one where kids get stuck, you know, and that inevitably happens and it's about sort of that moment and understanding that moment and how they, how they get out of it and how they, how do they do it and the, the, all the lessons and all the good stuff are there. But, um, you know, it's also watching, uh, you know, being an Olympic sport fan. I just remember watching the Olympics um, as, as young as I can remember and the, the whole, all, all the lessons in the Olympic movement. Um, are ring true to, to all athletic endeavors. And here at, uh, at Culver, fencing at Culver, um, you know, we have a few Olympic sports, but it's something near and dear. Um, and I mean, it just mirrors a lot of things that the, the Culver uh, mission um, attempts to do. Uh, so I think that um, for me coaching, um, what's changed over the years is um, I listen more than before. I think the lessons that I have from our kids is that uh, every kid is different. Every situation, what might look the same is different. And um, uh, letting the kids discover what is going to be best for them in the problems that they have, that they have outside of fencing, that they, they lean on me for, for help and mentorship. Um, but, if, you know, uh, I don't know. I think, I think at the end of the day, it's just, um, we just want the kids to have fun and be high level competitors and um, grow in their sort of worldview of every situation is not provided to you and you have to work and it won't always go as planned and how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna you know, respond to that and uh, overcome, uh, overcome challenge and meet it. So that, that's the most rewarding part is seeing the kids grow and um, in each, each kid and each quad is, is different because we're attracting more kids now with, with fencing experience uh, due to the success of our program and um, what, they, what they need is different um, uh, from a technical, uh, technical side and um, we're, we're there for them. Uh, but they still need all the same teenage things too. Um, and it's fun kind of before it was we needed more skill level and uh, maybe less of the problem management kind of thing. And now we're doing more on the skill level, but then maybe we, you know, so seeing that change over time is, 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 is great.